there was very little information out there for me to work with, so I just kind of had to like figure things out for myself, and I just kept working on it every day, and then once I got to that, I was like, this, this is what I want to do, like this is the thing. Hey there, everybody. It's episode 51 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. Donovan Barrett. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, but on the show, I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak. Whistlekick, in case you didn't know, makes the world's best sparring gear as well as great apparel and accessories, all for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of you returning fans. If you're not familiar with our products, you should check out everything we offer, like our sparring gear. We use better quality materials and more reinforcement than what you may be used to. It all makes for a more comfortable and yet durable product. Check it out at whistlekick.com. If you want to check out our other podcast episodes, those are over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. We offer great content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. Now let's move on to the episode. On episode 51, we get some time with Mr. Donovan Barrett, a WTF Taekwondo practitioner from the Gulf Coast of Florida. Mr. Barrett is an exceptional kicker with amazing flexibility and a great passion for the martial arts. We first met him on social media, and after a lot of conversation, we selected him as one of our brand ambassadors. While we do what we can to help our partners, we're not talking to Mr. Barrett, or Mr. Donovan as he's called in his doge, because of our relationship with him. Rather, We think he's an exceptional martial artist with great stories and a passion for sharing his passion. It doesn't take long in the episode for you to understand just how much this young man loves what he does. Mr. Donovan, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to have you on. You and I have spent a good deal of time emailing. Yes. Of course, you know, um, you know, one thing we'll put out there right away so people can't say we're trying to hide anything. You are one of Whistlekick's brand ambassadors. Yes, I am. Very excited so, to be. Yeah, and we're excited to have you. And so uh, we're not going to spend the whole time talking about Whistlekick. Of course, this is all about you, and we want to hear about you. And I'm excited because I'm going to learn a lot more about you during this process, just as everybody listening. I'm excited. So why don't you start the way we ask everyone to start? How did you get started in the martial arts? Um, that's actually interesting. I actually got uh, martial arts lessons as a when I was seven years old, and it was a Christmas present. Um, and basically, I, when I was younger, I thought that being a ninja was a viable career, so that's what I wanted to be. <laughs> and um, so my aunt bought me Taekwondo lessons and called them my ninja lessons or whatever. So that's how I got started uh, doing Taekwondo. Do, do you remember what it was like being seven and having your expectations of what ninja lessons would be and getting out into the dojo? Yeah, I definitely do. And to be honest, like, it was everything I had hoped. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, really? Like, yeah, it was. Like, I was like Okay. Oh, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, over time, I learned that it was different. But when you have no idea what martial arts is, as soon as you throw any kind of kick, it's like, oh, my God, I'm a ninja, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So started at seven and you know we don't have to talk about how old you are now but there's been a chunk of time in between there what's kept you involved uh well it's kind of funny because i've been doing it you know for 12 years now and essentially i went through a long phase where i actually did not like martial arts i like it was i was going through that teenage phase where i didn't like anything you know <laughs> and, yeah. um it was kind of interesting because at school I didn't have very many friends and like when I went to Taekwondo, like even when I wasn't into it, like that was like my safe place. Like that was like everybody liked me there. Like I had a lot of friends there. And so even when I wasn't necessarily into the martial arts aspect, I always loved being in the dojang. And then what happened one summer, I think I just like my um my instructor just lost it because um he would always like bark at me and say you have all this talent and over the last couple of years you have just like not even like been using it like what's going on and i don't know like my mind i was just like so spaced out into this whole different world and uh, then what happened one day when i was 16 i just a light bulb went off in my head and i went up to my instructor i was like i think i want to like be the best so <laughs> and i think he just like lost his mind he's like are you serious <laughs> like and so every summer, every day during the summer, we got out there and we trained for two or three hours and um, got me 
um, and that kind of started my fundamentals of where I am today. Okay. So what did that mean to you then wanting to be the best? How, how was that different? Oh, how was your perspective different? You mentioned a light bulb. What, what was your thought process? I mean, my thought process was that, you know, I have no direction in my life. I had no idea like what I wanted to do. I wasn't passionate about anything. And I don't, I can't really describe it. It was just like a random thing. It's like, you know what? This has like always been a place. This is something that I could easily be great at. Um, this is something that a teacher has shaped me into the person I am today. Take the sports side out of it. Take the physical side out of it. Like my personality derives from the dojang. And um, I was just like, you know what? Like, I kind of questioned why I didn't like martial arts. And I didn't really have a good reason other than I'm angsty and I don't want to do anything. So I was like, we're going to give it a shot. I just, it was really just a spur of the moment thing. And then it just became into this like burning passion of mine. Sure, sure. Now, what you're describing with being a, a teenager and feeling some mixed uh, directions in your life and, and feeling pulled potentially away from the martial arts. That's something that I think a lot of people experience. I know personally, I experienced it. I struggled with staying dedicated to the martial arts, especially in my early teenage years. Mm -hmm. Was it just your friends in the dojang that kept you there or was there parental pressure? Uh, no, my parents were actually very cool. They are kind of the kind of people where it's like, you know what, if you're not passionate about this, you you don't have to do it but you're gonna do something you know we don't want you just having free time but they were but um they were kind of like disappointed that i wanted to quit because i literally was probably weeks out from quitting martial arts i had my um i had a red belt like i was so close to black belt and i was just like fed up with it and um i made it to black belt because i was like i'm so close but then i was still like oh i think i'm gonna quit and then all of a sudden like literally weeks out um the light bulb went off so it's pretty fortunate yeah <laughs> yeah I don't, yeah now may, maybe you don't but do you have any thoughts that you would share i mean usually we get to the thoughts and the advice towards the end of the episode but i think there's a good opportunity here do you have any recommendations for people that might be in that space or parents or instructors of people that are in that space thinking like they may want to quit um if i was a parent and i had a kid in martial arts who wanted to quit i would do this i would say you're going to make it to your first degree black belt that's just going to happen and then i would um i would kind of like go on the internet um and t show them some different aspects of martial arts because sometimes what for me when you're in that dojing and you don't have any broader aspect of what martial arts is it's very easy to not appreciate it so um give them like show them some like awesome martial artists that are like doing cool things and stuff like that that are different than what he may be doing in the dojang because that really really helped me like oh this isn't just in this dojang there's like this whole like world of people out there doing this stuff so make sure you don't just trap them in the four walls of the, their dojang make sure you know go on the internet look up some stuff and um that would be my biggest advice for and if you're in that spot i would just say you know of, like i did evaluate what it is that you don't like about martial arts and if you can't really come up with a viable answer then you know i think it's time to assess like what maybe you're doing wrong sure sure now if i could kind of take what you said and maybe put a little spin on it see if you agree one of the things that i found in martial arts is that there are so many let's call them segments or, or sections and for example flexibility is one of your big passions and the kicking that you can do with your flexibility. Mm -hmm. I would say that there's probably some segment of martial arts that's going to appeal to just about everybody. Right. So, yeah, by all means, find your niche within the martial arts. Hopefully there is one. Yeah. And yeah, keep plugging along and there's make so it your thing. There's many different options in martial arts. Like, you know, there, like you said, there is something there for everybody. <laughs> Without a doubt. So let's get to story time now. I'm sure you've got a bunch of good stories. I know for a fact that you know some pretty prominent martial artists. We've talked a little bit about that. So I don't know what you're going to tell me. We haven't talked about it, but tell us your best martial arts story. Whew, there's so many. Um, I have a lot of good teaching stories. Uh, probably my... Mm, 
I think I'm going to say that my favorite memory, like my favorite thing that I've done in martial arts is the teaching story. And we have um, in our Jojang, there's a kid who he had, he was born with the complete right side of his brain, like not functional at all. Wow. So he, um, you know, when he came, he couldn't really walk that well. He definitely couldn't jump or whatever. And he, he was like, uh, when he started, he was like four years old. So he was in this little peewee class we had. And, you know, basically in that class, you just do a bunch of jumping, you crawl through tunnels. And he had such a hard time. He could not balance on one leg. And um, my instructor actually had him at first and kind of gave him some coordination. But I had him and um, I had him one day and it was just him and his twin brother. And he was just, you know, he really struggled with the forms department, remembering, you know, all the small details. I mean, as you can imagine, the whole side of your sure. brain does not like function right. that well. Um, so I remember just like, you know, most most of the time we can only spend so much time on each kid because there's other people to get to. But I was like, you know what? I have time with him. I'm going to spend a lot of time with him. So I literally just I pulled my instructor and I was like, Master Dan, I would like to take this kid and I would just like to have him the whole class. There's only three people here. Would you mind taking these two while I just take him in the back? And the kid, you know, we probably did the form like 30 times, but the kid finally got it. And then he passed his um, test with one of the highest scores um, in the whole room. So that's probably like my proudest moment when it comes to uh, martial art. Oh, wow. So what was it about this kid or this situation that really spoke to you that made you want to give so much time to him? Um, well, his mother actually would come into my instructor's office and I would be in there and she would literally like almost be in tears. She would just be like, you know, his brother is fun functions fine. You know, he's a little clumsy, but he functions fine. And I'm so worried that he's going to fall behind and, you know, nobody, you know, takes the time and, you know, he has so much struggle and I'm worried he's not going to be able to do anything, anything, anything. And his mom would come in the office and have that conversation. And honestly, like, she wasn't in denial about her uh, son's condition, but I think she almost should have been in at least not denial, but should have been, you know, a little bit more trusting that he would get it done because um, he, he, I mean, he's really smart, you know, he just has, you know, complications with certain things. There's just certain things that don't resonate with him. And he, um, and so I was like, my big motivation was like, you know, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. I'm even going to prove his mother wrong. And he's going to come out here and he's going to have great technique and he's going to do everything just like everybody else with not, with no problem. And that's what I set out to do. And that's what happened. So I'm going to guess you have a little bit of a soft spot for the underdog. I definitely do all the time. <laughs> okay. Is that reflect back on on you do you see yourself as the underdog or, or maybe you did at some point uh yeah i mean i've always like i said going through school I've never had many friends um i also um like i said wasn't i felt like i didn't really have a support system for a while so i was always kind of the alone kid so i was just like you know i'm gonna prove everybody wrong i'm gonna be this i'm gonna be that and then you know pete when i'm successful people are gonna wish that they had been a part of my life before so yeah i've always felt like the underdog and i mean it's a blessing and a curse because when you feel like you're the underdog you always are like training super hard like you're always just like at it at it at it but um it does get kind of lonely sometimes but i mean I, I like that quality about myself to be honest which quality? Uh, I like the quality that I have um, when it comes to being an underdog. I just have this mindset like, okay, everybody expects me to lose, so I'm going to win. Mm -hmm. You I, like to prove people wrong. Yeah, I love to prove people wrong. <laughs> I can relate to that. Use that as, as fuel. That's, that's your fuel when you get out and you're training and say, you know what? You said I couldn't do this. I'm not only going to do it. I'm going to do it twice as, as good as anybody else. Right. Get that. Awesome. Well, I think that's a great story. So let's take a step into an alternate universe. We talked a little bit about who you were in high school when that light bulb went on. What do you think your life would be now if you had quit the martial arts at that point? You know, I, I really couldn't even imagine. I have actually, I'm in college and I've shifted through many different careers. I was like, oh, maybe I'll be a psychologist. 
Because even when I was into martial arts, there was a point in time where it was like, okay, is this even going to be able to be a career for me? You know, it's not, there's not much of a track record for it. So I was like, okay, well, I've got to play it safe. So I looked into psychology and then I looked into this and I looked into like so many different things. And like, I could not stick with any of it. I did not feel passionate about any of it. So um, without martial arts in my life, I feel like I would have no direction. I'd have no kind of line of thinking. I would have no passion for anything. I wouldn't have any organizational skills because being in martial arts taught me all those things. It taught me how to like care about something and care about like something bigger than myself. And um, so without that, I would not even be in the same category of the person that I am today. Okay. Your description of what you might look like sounds like quite a few people that I know in their 20s, no direction and things like that. Yeah. I bet you know people like that. So it kind of goes back to my uh, one-man crusade, if you will, that everyone do martial arts at some point because I think everybody benefits from it. Yeah, I mean, I think there. my philosophy is, you know, if you have a child, they need to be involved in something, you know? Like, just, I mean, I think martial, to me, obviously, martial arts is the best choice because it's going to develop you as a human being as well as an athlete. But, I mean, just, like, if your kid is not involved in, like, something outside of school, then they're not going to be, they're not going to have an understanding of, like, oh, well, I can do something that I like, I like this, I can do that, and it it makes me a better person. So, I think it's very important that your child, like, I recommend martial arts, but, you know, at least something, you know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's weird. We are not at a, a point in time where school is going to provide everything. No. Not to people, <laughs> so for sure. All right. Well, life is full of highs and lows. I'm sure yours has been no different. I'd like you to think about one of the low points and how your martial arts experience or training helped you move through it. Um, for me, uh, God, I mean, my my whole school career was a low point, to be honest. Um, really? Yeah. Uh, like I mean, like I said, I'll say it again. No friends. Um, I also my grades in high school were just awful um they did not meet up to my what i was capable of doing um i i really struggled with finding my voice um i struggled with you know kind of being comfortable in my own skin like i hated every aspect of myself um from my personality to how i look to my sexuality everything um i hated everything about myself and um with martial arts it just kind of and it still is developing that confidence like a few years ago i never would have um i never would have started an instagram account because i didn't think anything that i was doing was good enough i didn't think um i would never have like reached out to anybody or i would never have reached out to you i would have never reached out to anything that is not something that i would have even been remotely comfortable doing a couple of years ago and now I'm at a point where it's like I, I mean I am so confident in myself that I, I ride this very thin line where I'm not quite cocky but I'm like the step before cocky <laughs> confident <laughs> yeah. absolutely and I think that that's where most of us as martial artists hope to be you know and absolutely it's a fine line and sometimes you're gonna put a toe over it some of us take a, a big running jump over yeah. it but <laughs> life or somebody else that's better is going to push us back. And that's always good. Yeah. So what talk more about that transition, because I think that's something that a lot of people listening may, may benefit from. Well, to be, I mean, I guess I'll just be completely open about it. Um, I was not open about my sexuality at all um, until my senior year in high school. I was like, you know, first of all, I was a martial artist. So I was into martial arts before I came out. Um, mm-hmm. And I was like, well, I'm a martial artist, so there's no way that I can be gay. That's just not a thing that happens. Like, you cannot allow that to happen um, because, you know, you're supposed to be macho or whatever, whatever, whatever. And then I just realized, you know, I got to a point where I would just keep training. And then I felt like, you know what? I'm so good at martial arts that anybody who has a problem with me as a person, you know, they can't say anything because... I mean, until they can do what I can do, then, you know, their opinion doesn't really matter to me. So it just got to a point in that transition where I got so good at martial arts that it was like, okay, I have a talent. I have something I'm really good at. And it's not something that a lot of people can do. So um, it made me feel a lot more comfortable in my skin. I was like, I have I found my voice. 
Um, and also just me, I hated how I looked. I used to have like the worst acne and I actually, it made it worse because I had to take these pills that like gave you suicidal thoughts. It gave you, you had to get your <laughs> blood tested for liver failure. You had to do all this. It made your lips like completely like messed up. So it was that bad. And so, um, so I just like, I hated looking at myself in the mirror. I hated, um, going to school because I knew I wasn't going to have any friends and I hated, I mean, I just like hated every aspect of my life except for going to Taekwondo because I knew I had real friends there and I knew that I had people who cared about me there and wanted me to be successful, including my instructor. Okay. And I don't want to dig too deep into it because it's, you know, it's a really personal thing, but do you think that you coming out was kind of the start of that transition, starting to honor who you were? Um, it definitely was. Like, honestly, um, I'm completely open about anything. So um, dig as deep as you want. But <laughs> uh, but essentially, yes, that was the first step. And the, the first person I did it to was my best friend, Kendra. And she obviously was completely accepting. And um, it honestly didn't, I didn't think it helped me that much at first. I was like, okay, now what? But like once I started doing it to more and more people and then I realized, oh my God, this demon that I had built up for 17 years isn't there anymore. Like I can, it's it's like taking a 40 pound weight and just like, it's finally released. It's And now it's like, I feel like I would not be able to express my strong personality if I hadn't. Um, come out because when you feel like you have to restrict a certain part of yourself and it's like you're always conscious of what you're saying you're always conscious of how you're presenting yourself and there's always this double consciousness when you walk in the room it's like okay these people are here so I have to talk this certain way and then these people over here mm. talk this certain way there's always that double consciousness in the room and um, I mean that it's like it's awful I mean it's a terrible experience and I think a lot of us go through that at, at some point whether it's your sexuality or something different. I think a, a lot of us, as we come through being teenagers and, and sometimes far after, people don't honor who they are. So I think it's great that you were willing to take that step, that scary step. Yeah, I mean, the, all, the other thing that kept me from doing it was I was also like, I also, and I still don't, I don't want to be known as, oh, well, he's the gay martial artist or whatever. Like, you know, like, I don't want to fit into that small box. So, I'm, but I figured out, you know, how to kind of mold that. It's like, if you don't make it all about your sexuality, then it won't be all about your sexuality. Right. If you just if you just take the steps and you just do your martial arts the best you can and you don't hide who you are, but you don't like go around like, exploding it every chance you get then, um <laughs> right then you know it does become about the martial arts you just stick to what you're good at you stick to the talent and you know be yourself and that happens so no one refers to me as that um everyone just knows me as being a great martial artist <laughs> you're, you're not the gay martial artist you're a martial artist who happens to be gay exactly yeah and that's what i i, I really wanted that to be clear well, it's pretty darn clear now. You just said it. <laughs> awesome. So I'm sure you've had a ton of people that have influenced you, hopefully mostly positively through your martial arts career. But if you could name the one or two people who had the strongest influence, who would those be? Uh, that's easy. Definitely. Um, number one is Chloe Bruce. And number two is Ronda Rousey. Chloe Bruce is number one okay. because she is actually the reason that um, she is one of the biggest reasons that I didn't quit martial art. Because like I said, I was trapped in that dojang. So all I saw was like, okay, this is Taekwondo. This is what it is. You got a side kick. You got a hook kick. You got a round kick. Great. Um, but then I saw her one day and I was just like, oh my God, like this is what martial arts can be. Like this is what I can do with these fundamentals that I've gained all these years in Taekwondo. So um, obviously no one in my dojang had ever seen that before. They didn't have any knowledge of how to get there. So I was kind of on my own, which I enjoy. Like, and I got myself, I started stretching. I started doing a lot, so much research. Um, let, me, let me just jump in for a second. For people that are listening that may not know who Chloe Bruce is, could you just tell us a little bit? Um, she is, um, well, obviously a martial artist and she excels in flexibility. And, um, in my opinion, when it comes to basic kicks, she is one of the best, if not the best. She's also a stunt double. She was in Guardians of the Galaxy and as the stunt double for Gamora. And she was actually in the recent Star Wars movie as the stunt double for Rey. 
as well as in many other things. Um, she performs, she models, she, um, yeah, so she's kind of paved a way for martial artists that wasn't really necessarily available before. Mm -hmm. So that's, okay. yeah, that's why. I, sorry, to, sorry to jump in and break your No, trust. no, no. Um, but um, she, once I saw that, I was just like, okay, well, if this is what I can do, then I, then I love this. And so I just got to work. Like I said, I was doing so much research um, on flexibility, like re like every, I went to the depths of the internet to find any small bit of information. And in reality, flexibility is a subject that uh, we're, it's still, um, we're, nobody's really all that knowledgeable about it yet. Like, yes, we've come a long ways, but there's still so much not known about it. And um, so it was like, there was very little information out there for me to work with. So I just kind of had to like figure things out for myself and I just kept working on it every day. And then once I got to that, I was like, this, this is what I want to do. Like, this is the thing, like, this is what martial arts is to me. So um, I would, she, she, I give her so much credit for the development of my um, passion for martial arts. Have you told her? Uh, yeah, I actually had a private lesson with her. <laughs> Oh, cool. That must have been a, a dream come true. It for was you. definitely a dream come true. It was one of the best um, experiences of my life. <laughs> awesome. And the other one you mentioned was Ronda Rousey? Uh, Ronda Rousey, yes. And, you know, there's so much press on going on about her right now <laughs> because yeah. she got beat. But um, honestly, I what inspired me about her, you know, I liked her. I liked that she was actually a real martial artist. She didn't start in MMA. She was a uh, a, gold, a bronze medalist in the Olympics for judo. So I was like, she has like a real like martial arts background. So I really liked that about her. Um, I really liked that she was confident, even if sometimes she stepped over that line we talked about previously to the cocky line. Um, but I re what really inspired me about her was that I read her autobiography and it is my favorite book that I've ever read in it. Um, she, I mean, she's been through it all. Like, I feel like before you judge Ronda Rousey, you have to read that book because, I mean, she has really just fought every second to get where she was now. And the reason that she inspires me is because she gave me this perspective in her book. And it was like, she described it as this because she, after the Olympics, she had to live in her car. She was homeless because people think the Olympics pays your bills for the rest of your life, but it doesn't. Um, and she was like, she had this perspective and she was like, you know what, one day I'm going to write a book and this is the part of the book where I struggle and then it's going to all turn out big in the end and it's going to make my success story better. So ever since I read that, I was like, oh my God, that's like brilliant. So I've been thinking of my training and my life in that way as well. When things are hard, I'm like, okay, this is the part where I go through the struggle and it's all going to be good in the end. Very well said. Cool. Two wonderful role models, and of course, we'll have links to Rhonda's autobiography and a little bit more information on Chloe Bruce in the show notes over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. So, if anybody wants to check that out, there. So, let's talk about competition. Is that an element in your martial arts training? Uh, it's actually interesting because I have recently, um, starting this year, I will most likely not be doing any more uh, tournaments. Um, okay, why not? Because I found, you know, I appreciate them because it's kind of what got me started and, you know, it gave me a direction at first when I was in martial arts to kind of like have something to work toward. And I loved the traveling, but I just didn't really like the scene. You know, once I kind of saw like all these trickers and like Chloe Bruce and like all these people who were just doing martial arts for the sake of the art, um, I was really, really into that. Not saying that if you do tournaments, like you're not in it for the art, but I really like, I didn't enjoy the sports aspect as much as I did the art aspect and what kind of happened was that my training started to be completely split it's like okay I have to go practice forms over here for this and then I have to do this stuff which is what I want to base my career off of you know the picking mm -hmm. and the flexibility and it just got you know and then I also had college and this and that and it just got to be overwhelming and like everything was starting to suffer so I was like you know what I need to make this decision um and uh so I actually I'm not saying I won't ever do them again, but at this point in my life, um, I am not going to be doing any tournaments for a while. Okay. Tell us a little bit about what you – did you enjoy them I, when you no, were doing I, them? I loved – I did love them. I really did. Okay. What was it you enjoyed about them at that time? 
Well, what I loved about them at the time, like I said, it gave me a sense of direction because I didn't have that broad aspect of martial arts before. So it just kind of like, okay, well, there's a tournament. That's something to work towards. That's something that I can be training on until I figure everything out. And it's kind of your niche before you found your flexibility. Right, before, yeah, niche. before I found like my uh, what I was really passionate about. And um, I really, you know, I met some awesome people through tournaments. I mean, if you if you're a martial artist, I highly recommend at least going to a few tournaments because you really like get a um, get to meet some of the best athletes in the country and in the world. And um, I've made a lot of friends doing tournaments. And um, you know, you have a great time because they all share this passion of martial arts like you do and you go out there and you compete against each other and you know you're like complete sworn enemies when you're in the ring and then as soon as you walk out you're like cool again you're friends so i loved that yeah. i loved the traveling um so i mean i i did love that about tournaments and yeah so those are my favorite things okay if you could train with any martial artist living or even dead who would that be and why well, I've already trained with Chloe Brew, so that was definitely number one on my bucket list. <laughs> um, you know, I would love to actually, uh, I'd love to train with a uh, Superfoot Bill Wallace, to be honest, because um, he actually, you know, he does quite a bit of flexibility and, you know, fast kicking as well, but he does it in more of a sparring aspect, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would kind of like to, like, see some of his movements, see kind of like, you know, what he's doing and for drills and stuff like that. So I think I would choose him. Well, we might be able to make that happen. And, and for, for listeners, um, Mr. Donovan's actually about as close to where uh, Mr. Wallace lives as anybody really could be. You're, you're a matter of miles away. So maybe we can make that introduction and, and help you out because he is a great guy. Yeah, he seems like an awesome guy. I would love to do that. Great. So, of course, you produce a lot of videos for YouTube. And I'm going to guess that you're a movie guy. Uh, I, am, I, am, I, am I right? Uh, it, it really depends. <laughs> okay. I, I All love right. – I, um, when I find a movie that I really love, I watch that movie like 45 times like in a day. However, it's very hard for me to sit down and watch a two-hour movie if it's like new to me. You know, like I have my franchises that like I love to watch, but – um. Movies that I can always watch are like action movies. Like if there's like, you know, and usually what I'm paying attention to is like, oh, I wonder who the stunt double for that guy is or oh, how's the technique of his kicks and how's the technique and all that stuff. So um, I can generally watch action movies really easily. Do you have any favorite martial arts movies? You know, I don't really have any favorite martial arts movies per se. They're mostly um, my favorite movies have great martial arts in them. Okay. Um, like I like I uh, I don't know if you've seen the uh, Netflix. It's actually a TV show, um, the Daredevil series on Netflix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't exception. know who the stunt double is for Daredevil or whatever, but that guy is amazing. Like I want to figure that out and look him up because he's whoever he is, he is very talented. Um, and I also liked Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, Cl uh, um, Chloe's fight scenes against one of the mm -hmm. other characters I thought was really really well done. So yeah, those are probably my top two picks. For that. Those are great. And if you like Daredevil, I don't know if you're restricted to Netflix or if you get broadcast TV, but the AMC show uh, Into the Badlands. Oh, really? Just catapulted to the top of my list. Absolutely. It's if you if you like good choreography, especially with more of a Chinese influence, that's the show. It's fantastic. Yeah, I that's I really love good fight. I, I look for good fight choreography in video games. I look for it in movies. Um, I also it's not really martial arts, but the um one of my favorite choreographed fights is actually the um chronologically the third Star Wars movie, Episode Three. Really? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people. I know a lot of people hate the prequels, but you have to understand. When I saw the prequels, I was a young kid, so I just thought everything was cool. So it's all this. It's very nostalgic for me. So even when I watch them today, I see past all the flaws that people pointed out, and it's like, oh my god. But no, that the last scene where um, Anakin was fighting Obi Wan, I was like, wow. <laughs> well, I thought that was really well done. With I'm taking a note. Make sure see if I can find that link to it in the show notes. Yeah, go ahead. But um, yeah, that's another because it was like. You know, I, I paid close attention. I was a huge Star Wars nerd growing up. Like, I knew all the names of the ships. I knew all the names of the droids. I knew, like, I knew everything. I read the novels. 
And, you know, you saw a lot of good, you know, lightsaber duels in Star Wars. But to me, it's like the amount of preparation that those actors had to go through that fight scene must have been ginormous because it was so fast paced. There were so many like things going on in their environment or whatever. So I just like I really applaud them for um, pulling that together so nicely. Sure. And of course, you saw episode seven and and I saw your reaction on your YouTube channel to episode seven. I know you know you enjoyed it. But did you see the announcement about Daniel Wu in episode eight? I, I saw um, a story about that, but I did not hear exactly. I didn't read it. I don't know exactly what's going on with that. They, they've they said very little. And I think we shared that out over social media within the last week or something. But Daniel Wu, who is the star of Into the Badlands and one of the producers, <laughs> has been signed on for episode eight. And he is a tremendous martial artist. Oh, that's so, awesome. Yeah. It's, I know. It should, um, it should be good. I think Chloe Bruce has said that she is also signed as a stunt double for the next movie as well. However, oh, cool. Yeah, the only that was my only big disappointment in um, episode seven. And I mean, I understand it because, you know, Ray was like a new Jedi or whatever. So obviously she's not going to be like, um, you know, destroying the field. But um, I was, right. you know, they, they hired Chloe Bruce. I'm like, where where is my scorpion kick? Where is... <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was like, hopefully they see that in the next movie. I believe that she signed it up for the next movie, but I can't remember. Well, here's here's to hoping. Yeah, I'm hoping. <laughs> so, if we push Chloe Bruce over into the realm of non actor, because I'm going to guess you you choose her. Do you have a favorite martial arts actor? Favorite martial arts actor. Hmm. You know, that's strange. I don't, you know, I like, I mean, there's none that I dislike. You know, I, I, lo I will love Jackie Chan because he's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I love Jackie Chan. I feel like that's a very broad answer. I feel like everybody loves Jackie Chan, but, you know, you can't help it. He's hilarious and he's so talented at martial arts. I remember I saw him dress up as Chun Li from Street Fighter once. <laughs> that was hilarious. Yeah, I remember seeing that as well. I remember the first time that I saw. Rumble in the Bronx. It was in theaters with with a couple of my friends opening night and what was that, ninety six, I think. I don't know. Somewhere back there. And it just it completely changed my perspective on martial arts because here was amazing choreography with maybe not the best plot, maybe not the best acting, but a sense of humor that I'd never seen in a martial arts film before. Yeah, exactly. That's what I liked about it. It was very modern, very um well, like his movies are generally very modern. And um, I really like that about it. Um, and hmm? here, here's, a, here's a little bit of, of trivia for you. And, um, of course, the episode that we recorded that has this information just came out today. It's, it's, a, it's a Thursday, and we do our thir shorter Thursday episodes. The t here's trivia. The top four grossing martial arts movies of all time Three of them are from the same franchise, and your clue is Jackie Chan. Any guesses? Hmm. It's from the same franchise. I feel like it's so obvious. <laughs> it, it is. It's Rush Hour. Rush Hour, really? Okay. The Rush Hour movies are, are three of the top four grossing martial arts really? films of all time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was surprised that Hollywood puts them in there, but you know, I guess if you think about it, there actually is quite a bit of martial arts in there. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of surprises me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so books, we talked a little bit about your love for Ronda Rousey's autobiography earlier. Are there any other books that have really spoken to you? Um, when it comes to my read, I mean, that's my favorite book. When it comes to my reading, um, I don't specifically read martial arts books. I like reading biographies about successful people who are doing whatever they're doing. So um, you give me a like, you know, I, I'm a YouTuber, so I have a lot of biographies on YouTubers as well, so I love those. But I don't really – my my taste in books is kind of like my taste in movies. I have a really hard time finding books that I like, but once I find one, I'll read it like 800 times. So Really? How many times have you read Rhonda's autobiography? Uh, six. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. That that's I... Well, honestly, the way it's organized, every chapter is like a quote or like a piece of advice. And then um, 
you and then it's like the chapters are really short so you can just read that and um what i like so like i actually keep the book i actually lent it to my friend right now so um i don't have it but i usually keep it in my gym bag and whenever it's like you know things get really tough or i'm really lacking motivation i just pick it up turn to a chapter read the quote read the small chapter and then i'm ready to go so um it's something i keep with me all the time oh, six times have you found yourself quoting it to people oh yeah i quote it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's the type of thing I would do too. So you've had quite the transformation, you know, from, from maybe dropping out of martial arts to becoming inspired and, and I would say probably even more inspired. I mean, just in the short time I've known you, you seem more impassioned about martial arts. And I think that's great. But what, what are your goals? What are you hoping to accomplish within martial arts? Um, for me, um, well, as far as the physical aspect, I just am, I'm always focused on improving myself, always, you know, getting that kick a little bit stronger, a little bit higher. Uh, I also want to, I also would like to, uh, expand into, um, learning a little bit, um, of different martial arts. Like I'd like to kind of learn a little bit of judo and, um, I'd like to tackle a little bit of boxing as well to develop my hands because, um, it's a challenge for me. Um, but uh, mentally, you know, it's just to be a better person than I was every day. Um, every workout, I always say this, that every workout needs to be better than the one I had before. Um, and then career-wise, my big thing is my YouTube channel right now. I would really, really like to develop that. And eventually, um, I would like to, like, travel and teach people and perform. And I'd like to, uh, one day I'd like to start my own clothing line, to be honest. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Now you mentioned your YouTube channel. Uh, what's the address on that? How do people find you out in cyberspace? Uh, well, my username is Donovan TKD, just like my Instagram. And um, you can find it just youtube.com slash Donovan TKD. I spell my name slightly differently. Instead of D-O-N-O-V-A-N, I spell it D-O-N-A-V-A-N. So. Okay. Um, so it should be pretty easy to to find if someone types your name correctly anyway. Yeah, it's super easy to find, and you'll find tons of uh, flexibility tutorials, kicking tutorials, some vlogs, um, and some of my workouts on there. And I'm really excited because I'll be posting every Wednesday, and um, I've kind of figured out the direction of what my channel is going to be. So I'm really excited for the new year to make that happen. Oh, great. That's awesome. And, of course, you're still training and active, and are you still instructing? Uh, I actually have um, recently started instructing again. What happened is my dojang actually had to close for a month. Oh. Yeah, um, because our whole plaza got bought. <laughs> <laughs> and so the whole thing got bulldozed down. And um, so they had to close for a month. They just reopened. And I'm not permanently back there. Trust me, I cannot wait to be permanently back there. Um, I have a meeting with my instructor today, actually, but um, I just started, I taught on Monday and, you know, it's such, you know, when you go from teaching martial arts to like stocking shelves, you know, it's just like, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite thing about teaching? Um, the, the stories that come out of it. Like, I love when a kid that everybody, you know, thinks is such a challenge and then I turn him into something. I really like I like to me every child is like a canvas and it's like I'm cre I'm creating the best masterpiece that I can with each one of those children and um uh, a lot of those kids have turned out to be like younger siblings of mine like um I know a lot of the kids were so upset cuz I had to work yesterday and the day before so I wasn't teaching and I got so many texts and phone calls like where are you where are you <laughs> um, oh, that's got to make you feel good it makes me feel good uh, like literally um, my martial arts, like the parents, the kids, they, they are all my family, and I, I love them a lot. Oh, that's great. And, I'm, you know, something I can relate to, and I'm going to guess most of the people listening to, at least those that train, feel the same. Yeah. So let's wrap it up. You've got any good advice for the people that are listening? Parting words of wisdom? Um, my best advice, and this is what I – this is my advice I've been following recently, that if you want to develop a career and – martial arts or really anything even if it has never been done before if you believe you can do it then it will happen and i know that sounds cheesy but i'll expand into a little bit more if you have this mindset like i don't know if this is going to work it's never been done before you're really hurting yourself but if you're just like if you make it to the where there is no doubt in your mind that you will be successful at this then things just start happening i just 
decided that I work too hard to fail at what I'm doing. So it's just going to happen. <laughs> and um, that's my best advice. Thanks for listening to episode 51 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And thank you to Mr. Donovan for spending some time with us. Head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for the show notes with links to everything we talked about today, including information on Chloe Bruce, his idol, that picture of Jackie Chan dressed as Chun-Li, and a video clip from the Star Wars fight scene we discussed. If you like the show, please subscribe or download one of the apps so you never miss out in the future. And if we could trouble you to leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts, we'd really appreciate it. Remember, if we read your review on the air, just contact us and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. If you want to be a guest on the show, or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the form on the website. And don't forget, subscribe to our newsletter so you can stay up on everything that we're doing. Please follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. And remember the products we make here, like our sparring gear and a whole bunch more at Whistlekick.com. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.